Hello, coming to you from the joyous land of board gaming, Omaha, Nebraska. Welcome to the Out of the Dust podcast. I'm your host, Reflective Bryce Journey. Tied in with the popular recurring Out of the Dust geek list on Board Game Geek, the Out of the Dust podcast is a weekly podcast that is focused on re-exploring games we play that we hadn't previously played in a year or more. Why did the game get dusty? Why did you decide to dust it off? How does the game compare to how you remembered it? Are you likely to play it more often in the future? These are the questions that we're interested in examining on Out of the Dust. We're back after a few weeks off for the holidays. And this week on the podcast, episode 26. On the Out of the Dust segment, I'll bring the Ravens of Three Sahashri out of the dust, and a computer will dust off Lord of the Fries. On the reaction segment, I'll revisit the latest developments of the Sentinels board game. On the What I've Been Playing segment, I'll review the Totally Liquid expansion for Dinosaur Island. On the Obscure Bryce Game segment, I'll review Mound Builders. And we wrap up the episode by concluding my top five food games countdown with number one on the list. I had a chance to bring one of the most unusual games in my collection out of the dust recently, The Ravens of Three Sahashri, a two-player-only cooperative card game from designer Kuro and published by Japan Brand in 2013. I last played it two years and 15 days ago. I was restocking my small games bag that I bring to get-togethers and looking over my small games shelf to see what I might be inspired to add. I keep my smallest card games in an old letterbox I rescued from an office somewhere. Ravens of Three Sahashri jumped out at me and I thought, Hey! I haven't played this in a while. When a two-player opportunity arose at my very next get-together, I suggested it to my friend Matt, who I do like to anime-style games. Unfortunately, I'd forgotten that the rules were pretty unintuitive, and it's the type of game that requires going over them again before play. I had to spend a few minutes refreshing myself on how the game worked before we played, but the play went well and we lost, which is what usually happens in this game. It can be pretty tough. I wouldn't mind playing it more dedicatedly with my wife and going through the sealed envelope challenge that comes with the game, but honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it got dusty again before we have a chance to do that. There's a lot of games in my queue nowadays, thanks to Christmas. Let's see what a contributor brought out of the dust. Jefferson Krogh, username Cobalt Curry Chef, brought the amusing Lord of the Fries out of the dust. Published in 1998 by Steve Jackson Games and designed by James Ernest, Lord of the Fries is one of the original zombie games we get thanked for bringing zombies into the board gaming hobby as a theme. Jefferson last played it 17 years, 10 months, and 20 days ago, and currently rates it a 6 out of 10. He writes, The first thing to know is that the time elapsed is just an estimate. It's probably been even longer than that. Honestly, I forgot I even still owned a copy. My memory is that I kind of hated this game. I don't really remember why. Perhaps because my friends always wanted to play this when I really would have preferred to give me the braid. My friend brought it before Thanksgiving, and we played it, and it was really rather fun. So now I'm glad I still have a copy. Thanks for the contribution, Jefferson. That's some epic dust level on that one. <laughs> Reaction segment time. Listeners may recall way back in episode 5, I discussed a controversy about a planned Essen release game called Sentinels, a superhero-themed game from Ludonaut that was totally not meant to take advantage of a certain other super popular, similarly-themed game with almost the same name. Listeners will recall that Ludonaut was considered enough to respond to gamers' concerns, denied any ill intentions, and believed there was nothing in common between the games that could possibly cause confusion or controversy. Despite gamers' friendly suggestions that they might want to change the name of their game, Lou did not strongly imply that they didn't think there was a need to. Well, several months later now, I have an update for you. The game has just released in North America, and Lou did not change the name! It's now called Last Heroes! Perhaps not the most optimistic of titles, but a definite improvement, I'd say. 
So let me give some props here to Ludonaut for listening to gamers' concerns and taking decisive action before releasing the game to what might have been an unfortunate fiasco. That's a short little update for this segment, so let's do a bonus reaction as well. Christmas just happened, and between the presents the cats bought me and presents from family and friends, there were about 30 games under the tree for me and my family. That will keep us busy for a while. I've already played Villainous and The Reckoners with my wife, a couple of games I foresee getting lots of regular play in the coming year. I like to punch, organize, and sort all the games before wrapping them, so most of them are actually ready to play right away. Though there is a stack of rule books for many of them that I'm still working through. I'm very excited to dive into the Solitaire games, Legacy of Dragon Holt to Nemo's War, that the cats got for me, and I'm looking forward to playing My Little Scythe with my son Luke, who picked it out for me himself with just a little guidance from my wife. My friend Kent and I exchange board game presents every year, and he got me a vintage X-Men game called Crisis in the Danger Room that looks like it will be good vintage fun. I plan to unleash Assault of the Giants on my friends Rob and Emily the next time my wife and I get together with them. And as for the rest of the stack, perhaps it's the deluxe edition of Taluva that I'm particularly looking forward to exploring the most. But how about you listeners? What Christmas games are you most looking forward to? This week on the What I've Been Playing segment, I'm going to tell you about the new expansion for Dinosaur Island, Totally Liquid. Dinosaur Island was my number two game of 2017, behind only Lisboa, so I'm already a fan of the game. But the expansion makes me like the game even more. It's a modular expansion with four components, all of which can be combined easily with the base game. The first module is the Marine Dinosaurs, which introduces some extra variety to the game. Previously, all the dinosaurs within a certain class were worth the same amount of points, granted the same level of excitement, and could only be claimed by a certain level of scientist. But each marine dinosaur is different from all of the others in these criteria, which influxes some welcome diversity to the game. Some other early reviewers believe some of these guys are unbalanced, but I haven't experienced that in my plays. The second module is the Executive Meeples and Park Facility Sideboards. The Executive Meeples introduce a variable player power to each player, and they've all been super impactful in the games I've played. Some of the sideboards, on the other hand, have been more impactful than others. The Reptile Hotel was pretty disappointing, but the Goat Pen is very handy. All things considered, this module is probably the most interesting of the bunch because of the different abilities it grants to each player. There are a lot of fun combos to explore in this particular module. The third module is the Park Blueprints, which introduces a unique diagram for each player and rewards the player with end-game bonus points for putting certain types of dinosaurs and attractions in certain spots of their park. I wasn't sure if I'd like this module or not, but the guidance and challenge it brings to the game has turned out to be a welcome addition. And so far in all the games I've played, how well a player did on following their blueprint has been the difference in winning or losing. I haven't played the fourth module yet because the concept behind it hasn't grabbed me as much as the other ones. This module are the PR events and introduce secret objective cards for each player. I'm not sold on this one because an additional objective hardly seems necessary in a game that already has up the number of public objectives at play for the revised expansion rules. But I'm also not crazy about the hidden objective also scoring points for my opponents. In my experience, this sort of hidden deductive objective rarely works very well in other games. I'm sure I will eventually try out this module, and maybe I will turn out liking it more than I expect to. But I'm not in as much of a hurry to dive into that one as much as I was the others. So that's Totally Liquid. I wouldn't label this as a must-have expansion by any means, but the additions have all been positive so far, and I appreciate the modular approach that many expansions like this one have been taking lately because this gives players the freedom to customize the game to their own unique preferences, which is always a lot of fun.
Obscure Bryce Game Segment Time. Ever since I had a chance to visit Cahokia, the ancient capital of the Mississippian Indian culture just outside of St. Louis, a few years ago, I've had an obscure, solitaire-only war game called Mound Builders on my wish list. Published by Victory Point Games in 2014, the game is designed by Wes Erty and Ben Madison, who have also designed several other obscure war games. Interestingly, even though it's classified as a war game using something called the States of Siege engine, coming from my perspective as a non-war gamer, I found the game felt a lot like a tower defense strategy game like Castle Panic. Here's how it works. At the beginning of each turn, a player reveals the next event card from the deck, which states how many action points a player gets to spend that turn, which of the five tribes are in ascendancy or descendancy, and which tribes are in revolt. During the first part of the game, a player uses their action points to build up their defenses by striking out from Cahokia, discovering new lands, incorporating these lands into their confederacy, and mounting them to establish bulwarks of defense and establish links to important resources. Even though this period of history covers several hundred years of Hopewell culture, in gameplay terms, it's only ten turns, and the time flies by before the Mississippian period of the game starts. In this part of the game, the quantity of action points is dependent on the number of resources a player managed to mound in the first part of the game, and the tribes get uneasy and go on the warpath each turn, which threatens the player's link to the valuable resources. If a tribe advances too far along their respective warpath, they will threaten Cahokia itself. And if the capital's palisades are ever depleted and breached, the player loses. That might very well happen sometime in this stage of the game, but at the very least, a player's defenses will be severely battered by the time the third and final stage of the game begins, the invasion of the Spanish. When the Spanish show up, they settle on one of the war paths, and thanks to their leader modifiers, advance even more ruthlessly than the hostile tribe did. Only if the player manages to hold off the relentless onslaught of the Spanish do they win. Far more likely, a player will succumb to their disease and might and fall. It's a satisfyingly challenging game, and I highly recommend it to any solitaire gamers out there looking for something completely different from anything else. I've only beat it once so far, and the game kept me coming back for more punishment before that finally happened. We conclude the seasonally appropriate Top 5 Food Games Countdown this week with my number one food-based game, Grand Austria Hotel. I love this dice-drafting game. I love opening up new rooms in my hotel. I love serving the guests. And I even love trying to keep that darn emperor happy. But I think my favorite part of the game is the tableau building with the employee cards and trying to fit together beneficial combos. I really like that element of the game in particular. I remember when I first learned this game a couple of years ago from my friend Chad. It's one of those games that you play that fills you with joy and you immediately think at the conclusion, Oh wow, this is a really special game. It would go on to capture the number one position of my top 10 games of 2016 list. It's also one of the few games in my collection that I bothered upgrading the components for, as I invested in the Meeple Source custom wooden food tokens to replace the cubes for this game. It was just impossible for me to resist the idea of a strudel meeple. Well, that will do it for episode 26. Thanks for listening. Feel free to join the Out of the Dust Podcast Guild at BoardGameGeek.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Out of the Dust BGG. Leave a comment at the Guild. PM me on BGG under user handle Radagast14. Or email me at Radagast14 at CenturyLink.net. And join the Out of the Dust conversation yourself at our monthly geek list at BGG. All right, play me out, Ananda!